to the lives, the dignity, the pride, etc., of all of his victims to have quite so much fun with, with Mao. But I have to say, he really is, when it comes to mass murdering dictators, he's about as fun as they come. You know, Adolf Hitler is not funny. Mao was funny. <laughs> he was very funny. I'm just going to give you a, a few uh, choice aphorisms from the philosophy of Mao. I mean, the one about how reading books makes you stupid, that one's pretty good too. But, um, okay, I'm going to start with the fart jokes. <clears throat> Okay, so, talking to the Politburo, the Chinese Politburo, that is not the Russian one, in 1956, Mao warns, apropos the Soviet Union, you know, right after the Khrushchev speech, he says, we must not blindly follow the Soviet Union. Every fart has some kind of smell, and we cannot say that all Soviet farts smell sweet. <laughs> I have no idea what that means, but it's funny. <laughs> okay. So, a couple years later, after the failure of the Great Leap Forward, I'll, I'll, get big, I'll explain what that is in a moment. He says, same group, addressing the Politburo. Comrades, you must all analyze your own responsibility. If you have to shit, shit. If you have to fart, fart. You'll feel much better. <laughs> okay. Now, finally, apropos the Cultural Revolution, as it's winding down finally in 1974, he says... Hmm, the need to shit after eating does not mean that eating is a waste of time. So you can see, he was a philosopher. Uh, he was a philosopher. He was many things Mao. I mean, he had, we, we know a lot about like his private habits. What was that? Did some, uh, what did you say? Oh, yes, yes, it's something like that, yeah. Or what is the, uh, what is the name of the... Um, the laws that everyone makes fun of. Is that the laws guy? You know, the laws that you make fun of? Is it, uh, wait, Nasratin Hoja, the story is about him, but. Oh, okay, that's him, right. But th that's the thing is, I mean, he was, you know, he was stupid in a way, but he was also, of course, Mao. I mean, the guy was a brilliant guerrilla leader. He came to power in the largest country in the world. So he can't have been completely stupid. But he was, he was very funny. He was also, of course, a mass murdering lunatic. Uh, but more on that in a moment. So, yes, we know a lot about his also, like, his, pers his strange personal hygiene habits because you know, his doctor left behind all these memoirs and so on. And the main thing about him was, you know, his mood swings. He changed his mind really frequently. As recently as 1944, you might remember from an earlier lecture, he actually wrote to FDR comparing himself to Washington and Lincoln and saying, you know, he wanted to turn China into a sort of uh, market democracy like the United States. Then a few years later, you know, after the U.S. sort of cut the rug out from under Chiang Kai-shek and Mao wins the Civil War, he, of course, decides, a little bit like Castro did, well, I was, I was a communist all along, but I'm going to be a really serious communist, okay, so I'm not going to mess around. So he's in power now, the nationalists have fled the Kuomintang, Chiang Kai-shek and his cronies and followers, along with all the Western ambassadors, they've fled to Taiwan. Mao is now supreme on the continent, although his regime is still not... You know, formally recognized as China by the United States until, I think, 1972, which went for the Olympics, too. They weren't allowed to compete until 1972, which, which helped all the other countries to win a lot more medals because China wasn't competing yet. Taiwan was too small to factor. But anyway, so the first major thing, of course, of Mao's realm was the Korean War. We talked a little bit about the Korean War in terms of its, its impact on world politics, on the United States with this famous uh, bill NSC-68, you know, leading to massive ramp up of military spending, permanent standing army, stationing of bases, 675 bases around the world, etc., etc. It also, of course, had a huge impact on China. Uh, you know, first of all, I suppose leading to a kind of, uh, you know, more of a self-confidence and pride, that they weren't just now independent of Western influence, but they had stood up to the Americans and essentially fought the Americans to a draw. I mean, there's no other way of describing it. You know, Korea, of course, still today is partitioned at the 17th parallel. Uh, I, I always get my Korean versus Vietnamese parallel. Anyways, partition. Um, still today, of course, it's a war zone. China, in other words, had fought the Americans, and, you know, essentially it was a draw. So, at the very least, you've got something to feel proud of. Um, Mao has this now as an achievement, of course, to help legitimize and popularize his regime. It also, of course, gave him an excuse. 
Now, war always gives any dictator, of course, an excuse to settle, shall we say, accounts with their enemies. Uh, the fog of war, it's sometimes called. War is also a pretext, of course. If you have a war, you might have traitors. You might have people giving information to the enemy. They had just fought, of course, a civil war right before this war. The Kuomintang presumably still had sympathizers or agents. You put all of this together and you had a great big pretext for a political purge. The execution of, as Mao liked to call them, counter-revolutionaries. No one really knows. These figures, all the figures today you should take with a grain of salt. In China we're talking about, of course, many millions of people. I mean, Mao himself talked in these terms. Mao actually scared the Russians when he started talking about nuclear war as like something that everyone should you know, get used to. You know, because after all, he said, yeah, we might lose 300 million people, but there'd still be a lot of people left. China is a big country. It's got a big population, as Mao himself knew. So anyway, best estimate, probably about 3 million executed, maybe. We don't know. Maybe it was 1 million, maybe it was 1.5, maybe it was 2. Um, there was a kind of ideological component. You know, he was in some ways, again, learning from Soviet communism, but he was also putting his own little spin on things. Some people have actually said that his own version of political theater had more in common with Hitler and that there was more pageantry and theatricality to it. You know, Soviet communism was more sort of drab and bleak and gray and boring, whereas Mao, again, was fun. So, anyway, they, they called the thought reform movement, I'm going to try to get the exact phrase, it was something like the movement for the study of Mao Zedong's thoughts, I think. Um, you know, they had all these uh, phrases, you know, from the Red East rises the sun, there appears in China Mao Zedong. So you see, they had like little rhymes that even apparently worked in English. But so, well, you know, kind of a, a thought cult about Mao and his thoughts, which eventually they collected in the famous little red book. Um, you have the execution of political prisoners. But after the war, things calmed down a little bit. Yes, they began thinking about nationalizing agriculture, the so-called land reform, which you got basically in all communist countries. And Mao did pursue this for a while in the mid-50s. And then he just kind of changed his mind. Nah. In 1956, he proclaimed, let a hundred flowers bloom. I have absolutely no idea what that means. <laughs> Supposedly, it was sort of like a, a softening of uh, the repression of the, the sort of the thought police, that they were now going to allow people to have their own thoughts, that not everyone has to think like Mao Zedong. And then he changed his mind about that again. And so... So you had kind of a, you know, little waves. This was a repressive extreme wave, then another kind of one. Then he sort of like eased up a little bit, and then he changed his mind again, and in 1957 proclaimed the great leap forward. Three portentous words. What did it mean, the great leap forward? Well, in a way it was akin to what the Soviets tried to do under Stalin. First five-year plan, collectivization of agriculture. I mean, Mao, after all, was a communist, supposedly. So he believed in the nationalization of property, industrial production, and, I guess, agriculture. Only Mao thought, and this was, was a little bit like, you might call it the Asian contribution to communist planning. You know, Mao thought that Stalin had sort of made a mistake. You know, on the one hand, you had the five-year plan with heavy industry, Magnitogorsk, belching steel factories. And on the other hand, you had the Ukraine, you know, piles of grain, lots of dead peasants, and so on. But Mao thought, maybe what you should do is you should, like, put them all together. Like, one great big opera of great leap forward. So that what Mao wanted was not just to industrialize agriculture and nationalize it in a collective sense, but he would also have all the peasants produce steel at the same time. And so anyway, so he decided not just to massively transform agriculture, nationalize it, put everyone in these like agro factories, but these agro factories were supposed to produce not only rice, but also steel. And so that's what they did. They uprooted the lives and traditions of about 700 million people, just like that. They said, you will now do things like this, the Great Leap Forward. Well, the interesting thing about the Great Leap Forward, among others, was that the Soviets who observed it, having done their own Great Leap Forward in the early 1930s, with its own devastating consequences, 
the Soviets were so horrified by it <laughs> that they basically said, we've had enough of this thing. And this is what led to the Sino-Soviet split. I mean, yes, there were strategic factors as well, you know, disputes over the border in Siberia, disputes over, again, whether or not it was a good idea to risk nuclear war with the Americans. The Soviets under Khrushchev kind of thought maybe you should be a little bit careful. Mao told them, remember, we've got 700 million people. We can afford to lose 300 million. He actually told, at one point Mao actually told the American ambassador this. He actually said point blank to the American ambassador, he said, well, look, you have to understand that, yes, if we have a nuclear war, you would lose hundreds of millions of people. And we would lose hundreds of millions of people. But the key fact is, we'd still have hundreds of millions of people left. <laughs> he actually told the American ambassador that, I kid you not. Well, so anyway, the, the most recent estimates of the Great Leap Forward, nobody knows how many starved to death, but we expect it was about 60 million people. So anyway, about 60 million dead. 60 million, give or take. They still have 640 million people left, so it's no big deal. Um, somehow decides after the Great Leap Forward that, hmm, well, we lost a lot of people, no big deal, still maybe it wasn't a good idea. So he goes before the people, I told you the guy is funny, and he actually apologizes. <laughs> he said, I'm sorry, I just killed 60 million people, he says. No, what he actually said was, um, uh, the chaos caused by the Great Leap Forward was on a grand scale, and I take responsibility. This is one of those great modern, like, wet phrases that doesn't really mean anything. You always hear American politicians say this. I take responsibility. Now, what does it actually mean? It means something bad happened, and I'm admitting that it happened. And I take responsibility. You're not really apologizing, I guess, literally. You're just kind of saying, bad thing happened, and I acknowledge that a bad thing happened. Okay, move on. Change the subject. So he apologized. And so you had another sort of let a hundred flowers bloom period where, again, they decide, oh, let's reverse our course and we're not going to do the same. We're not going to arrest as many people. We're going to allow people to live their own lives, you know, a little bit. And that lasts for a couple of years. And then in, around 1964, you hear the first rumblings of a new policy. Now, first what Mao said was this. Very, again, you have to, it's like reading the tea leaves. What does he really mean? He said, I do not approve of reading so many books. Now, it was actually two years later that he said reading books makes you stupid. But what he said is that I do not approve of reading so many books. What does that mean? I don't know what it means, but it seems to mean that Mao was getting sick of intellectuals. Stalin, there was a component of this in Stalin's rule. You know, the Trotsky types, you remember the anti-Trotsky rhetoric, because Trotsky was like this cosmopolitan intellectual who spoke different languages. His followers tended to be similar. You know, Stalin was a little earthier, a little bit like Mao. You know, he represented more the kind of, um, the kind of ignorant, violent criminal side, you might say, of communism. So Mao, that is, he's giving hints that maybe he's going to shift his policy again. No more of these hundred flowers blooming. They decide, you know, gradually, slowly, that they are going to turn on intellectuals. Um, so what does that mean? They're no longer going to support the kind of intellectual component of communism. Well, the more practical side of this was the anti-Western one. And here's where it begins to dovetail with some of what we talked about in Africa. Now, in a way, Mao is just going back to his roots. You know, an uncouth, semi-educated, semi-intellectual peasant riding the wave of hesperophobia, of anti-Western sentiment. There's a lot of it about, right? So now you start talking about clothes, or people dressing like Westerners, or people acting like Westerners. I don't know what this has to do with communism, but they're starting to talk about this. You don't want Western music. You don't want Western opera. You don't want Western... Um, you know, spectacles, eyeglasses, I guess. Maybe it's like an anti-nerd thing. They don't like nerds or something. But so here's what they do. They get together, and as they put it, um, we need to uh, create organizations of uneducated children. Um, I think that was it, right? Uneduc uh, they, they say, right, we need uh, to destruction... Uh, we need smaller and younger people who are not educated and corrupted by the West. Um, 
and they are going to purge us of Western influence. Okay, so what you got was the Red Guards, mostly between the ages of about 12 and 14, and uh, they gave them machine guns. So they took children, and they told them to look around for obnoxious Western-looking influences, people dressed like Westerners, people acting like Westerners, people reading Western books, people in bookstores, people near bookstores, people in opera houses, uh, people near opera houses. Um, so what did they do? Well, they began to attack these people. Um, sometimes they would attack girls and cut their hair off. Uh, sometimes they would attack people wearing glasses. Um, they would attack people with forbidden Western goods. Things like jazz records, <laughs> classical music. Um, they attacked cafes where intellectuals were known to congregate. They attacked theaters. Um, they ransacked libraries. They burned books. They brought together intellectuals and adults into large stadium-type institutions where they could gather lots of people and um, they would drag them and uh, they would shout things like, um, boil them in oil, smash his dog's head. Uh, there was one woman where they, they, they took her because she was wearing an evening gown and high heels. You know, and they dragged her before this baying mob of Red Guard teenagers and they screamed, down with ox devils and snake gods. I don't know what that means, but that's what they screamed apparently. And of course they tore her to bits. Uh, they banned all artistic expression. Um, they didn't shut down the universities. What they did, though, is they set up anti-intellectual committees of thugs inside the universities to persecute all of the intellectuals in the universities. Um, this is when Mao then announced that uh, the more books you read, the stupider you are. Um, and so they just began sort of mass murdering people. We don't know how many they killed. I think the number is about, you know, four to five hundred thousand. It was not as destructive, that is, of human life as the Great Leap Forward, which killed about 60 million. But in some ways it was more shocking. Because the regime had given machine guns to ignorant teenagers and told them to kill intelligent people, basically. That's what they did. That was the Cultural Revolution in China. Now it's true Mao changed his mind again. <laughs> he kind of sort of kind of apologized for the excesses of the campaign. But they didn't actually repudiate it until 1976. So the Cultural Revolution dragged on for another 10 years, destroyed root and branch what remained of China's own high culture in addition to, of course, Western culture. Because it wasn't just Western influence. I mean, they were attacking theaters and opera houses, which were actually showing Chinese shows, too. It was a massive anti-electual eruption of you know, proletarian energy, murderous proletarian energy. It's an interesting, I'm going to do another movie reference here. It's actually playing on DigiTurk this month. So, you can go home and watch it. Have any of you heard of the movie uh, Les Invasions Barbares, or in English, The Barbarian Invasions? It's not as well known as these other movies. It won the Best Foreign Picture Oscar. It's a Canadian, French-Canadian movie. Yeah, I know, French-Canadians. It won the Best Foreign Picture Oscar about five or six years ago. What's that? Fascinating movie. Okay, Barbarian Invasions, the title, I don't know what it really means. It's, there's this mood of sort of like, you know, decline of Rome, sort of decline of the West sort of mood. But it's basically about a college professor. <laughs> so, in fact, the fun, one of the most painful parts of the movie is when this college professor who's dying of cancer, now, he's an old lefty, you know, he's an old progressive type. His son, though, is like this uh, reactionary bond trader. You know, like he makes money, he's like a hedge fund trader, basically. And because it's Canada and they have National Health Service, the guy can't even get his own room. And so his son, who's rich because he's a capitalist, bribes the hospital and he takes like this whole floor for his father so that he can, you know, die in peace, more or less. But anyway, so one of the most painful scenes, <laughs> this guy was a professor his whole life, his son bribes a bunch of students to come visit the guy in the hospital and pretend like they actually cared about him. Very, very sad. But so I'm getting to the point here. The movie is basically about this man and he's dying. It's sort of an elegy to him and his kind. You know, these you know, well-meaning, progressive, you know, intellectual types. They love movies. They love cafes. They love getting together and having all these discussions. 
Once it's finally clear he's about to die, his son takes him away from the hospital ward. And, you know, they go to this house. It's like a lake house or something where they had their vacations. They had a lot of memories together. And he and all of his old cronies, they start reminiscing about the old days. And they're kind of half mocking themselves because they realize it's gotten a little ridiculous. They say, yeah, we were into every cause, weren't we? You know, we were into Mao back in the 60s. And, you know, we loved, uh, you know, we went whole hog for structuralism and then post-structuralism and then post-colonialism. And, oh, boy, we really went into feminism, too. And, you know, we loved this one cause after another. It's all harmless stuff. You know, they're talking about the various fads that they were into. And it's true, Mao was a big fad on college campuses in the late 60s. 60s. He even, of course, was in that old Beatles song. You remember, uh, you know, you say you want a revolution until I think Nike bought the rights to that. The whole thing about, yeah, if you something, something, Chairman Mao. I, I, don't, I don't remember what the original impetus was, but he was a big cause in the 60s. Well, so anyway, so the guy who's dying, the guy the movie is about, I forget his name. You know, he is, he's finally saying, well, look, you know, that was all great, but I can't get this one image out of my head. You remember back around 1975, we invited that Chinese poet to campus. You know, they're all academics, right? And they said, no, no, I don't know. He said, well, she was beautiful. And I went and she was, she was sitting in this restaurant. They had asked me because, you know, I was charge of the cultural something something committee. You know, he was like a literature professor, you know, to go and show around campus, kind of chaperone around campus. And he said, oh, as soon as I saw her, I was smitten. This Gorgeous, gorgeous Chinese woman. I walked over to her and I said, oh, I'm so pleased to make your acquaintance. He's flirting, obviously. He's like, I just think it's so amazing what's going on in your country. You're turning up upside down all the old traditions. You're tossing out all the old pieties. You're embracing everything that's new. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. She just stares at him and she says, my mother and father and grandparents were murdered by Red Guards. Yeah. There's more, though. He's, of course, shocked. He doesn't know what to say. So he asks her, why were they murdered by Red Guards? This is a French-Canadian intellectual, remember. She tells him, because they were caught watching a movie by Jean-Luc Godard. He is one of the great, you know, cinema varieties. It was the Nouvelle Vague in the early 60s. You know, this kind of avant-garde French director, who, of course, to them is a god, right? So anyway, her entire family was murdered because they watched this movie by Jean-Luc Godard. Anyway, so the guy, he can't get it out of his head. You know, he's, obviously, everyone does foolish things from time to time, but he felt really, really stupid. A lot of people felt that way once the truth about all of this emerged. But people cannot forget that Mao was a big cause in the 60s. It, it was partly because, you know, the Soviets were now passé, right? This whole tier mondism thing, right? The third world had become fashionable because... Well, basically, Khrushchev had gone up in 1956. I haven't even talked about this yet, but I should have. You know, Khrushchev, in his secret speech... I don't know why it's called secret, because it was immediately published in the communist papers all over the world. But anyway, Khrushchev had, of course, denounced Stalin's crimes. Not all of them, mind you. He hadn't denounced Stalin's you know, mass murder of the Ukrainian peasants and all of that stuff. He had denounced the fact that Stalin had purged the Communist Party. You know, so it was a limited, conditional condemnation of Stalin. But still, Khrushchev, as essentially the general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, had now denounced an entire era of Soviet history as being, you know, at the least, murderous and morally questionable. In a way, this is what really invented Tiermonism, or the third worldist movement among intellectuals. Because until 1956, they still believed in the Soviet cause, and now the Soviet cause had been discredited by the general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. So they had to believe in something. So maybe it was, again, the third world, Algeria, African decolonization. But now in the 60s, it was this great new thing. Mao, let a hundred flowers bloom. Mao, the great leap forward. Mao, the cultural revolution. And I kid you not, this stuff was hot. People wanted to be a part of it. Maybe they didn't really know the details. Maybe they didn't want to know. The amazing thing, though, is that you might think this marks the absolute nadir of the 20th century. That is the lowest moral point. The Red Guards in China. 
murdering intellectuals for watching French movies or dressing in high heels. No, it got worse. Mao had his imitators, although in a curious resonance, the French connection is still there. Um, the Cambodian dictatorship, we usually refer to as the Khmer Rouge, although the committee originally referred to themselves as Anka Lu. It was a committee of 20 intellectuals. Cambodia, of course, being part of Andochine, French Indochina, the elites spoke French, as you might expect. Most of them, of course, had been educated in Paris. This group happened to be in Paris, most of them, in the late 50s and early 60s. So, they were absorbing these doctrines of, you know, tiermondism, the kind of, the idea that anyone who was against the West was by definition virtuous. They absorbed also some of the fashionable doctrines of communism, and they called themselves communists. They had also absorbed some of the anti-colonial romance around this figure, Franz Fanon, and his theory of, you know, necessary violence, sort of virtue through violence. They weren't alone in this, actually. An American novelist called Norman Mailer, he was amazing, if, if you've ever heard about Mailer, he loved Franz Fanon. And he actually applied it to his own life. Uh, right before he ran for mayor of New York City, he was in the newspapers because he stabbed his own wife with a pen. Um, I think because, again, he believed in the doctrine of virtuous violence, that violence was ennobling and powerful. He wrote a whole essay about it. It was called The White Negro. He said that white people could embrace their true inner nature I, it's, it's something to do with blacks. I don't know what he meant about blacks. But basically the idea was they should be more instinctual. And they should fulfill their violent impulses and murder people if that's what they felt like doing. He wrote another whole novel called An American Dream, which was about a man who strangles his wife. It's amazing. This man won every literary award America has to offer. But Ankeliu, they were of an order slightly more serious, shall we say, than a man who wrote a novel about murdering his wife and then stabbed his wife with a pencil. They were of a moral order, shall we say, distinctly lower and more serious. 20 intellectuals. Twenty intellectuals went back from France. They formed a kind of political party. Eventually, it was more of a kind of a paramilitary group. They copied, again, some of these ideas they got in France, but then they also picked up this idea, the Red Guards. Because after all, I mean, here in a way, you could say, was the sine qua no of communism and the cult of the new. The bonfire of the old pieties and vanities the exaltation of youth and ignorance. If you think about it like this, I mean, after all, all of the great totalitarian movements of the 20th century focused on youth. If you're going to change the world, you start with the kids. You indoctrinate them. The parents, eh, they're too old. They already have their traditions, their ways. They're already set in stone. But if you get them when you're young, the Hitler youth, the Komsomol, the pioneers, these were the Soviet versions of this. You can indoctrinate them and teach them in the new ways, the new verities, the new truths. Or you can go one step better, like Mao, and you can exalt the fact that they actually don't know anything at all and just give them guns and tell them to go shooting. But that wasn't quite enough for these people, because they were unlike Mao. Mao, remember, was kind of like half intellectual, half peasant. He was like this earthy guy who had a lot of funny fart jokes, you know, who was, yes, murderous, but on the other hand, I think fundamentally he wasn't like that serious and intellectual. These were intellectuals pure and through. So they took this idea and they rammed it through to its most absurd logical conclusion. They were not just going to eliminate private property in the way of the Marxists. They were not just going to eliminate all existing traditions in the way of China and the Red Guards. They were not just going to expel Western influence in the way of the anti-colonialist movements in Africa, Franz Fanon, the Algerian FLN cause and all of that. They were going to do all of this together in one fell swoop in one day. Zero hour, 17 April. 1975. The Khmer Rouge takes over Phnom Penh, beginning at about 7 o'clock in the morning. City of 3 million people. They started with attacks on shops, then general looting. They began the killing at about 8.45 a.m. Fifteen minutes later, they cleared the military hospital. 
They took all the doctors and the nurses and the patients out of the hospital, pushed them into the streets, IVs and everything. They opened fire on anyone seen loitering in the streets. They told everyone that they were evacuating the city. They cleared out the largest hospital late morning. The temperature, by the way, was about 38 degrees and humid. Uh, they put everyone out into the street in the heat of the day. They started pushing them. They then went through all of the city offices. They took all the papers, all the records. They destroyed them. They burned them. They took all of the books. They threw them into the river. They burned the few books which were not drowned. They took all of the money in the banks and they incinerated it. They burned the money. They lit just <coughs> bonfire. They fired rockets and bazookas at any house where human movement or even animal movement was detected. Um, they cut off the water supply. This, by the way, this was a bunch of 12-year-olds carrying machine guns. They forced marched everyone into the countryside. By nightfall, a city of three million people had a population of zero. They then did this in all of the other big towns of Cambodia. They forced everyone out into the countryside where they were going to collectivize agriculture, I guess. I'm not quite sure if what the idea was, but these were what were called, famously by a New York Times journalist who actually witnessed some of this, the killing fields. Um, they had all these strange rules. Married couples were not supposed to talk to each other. They called that arguing. And so if you were seen talking to your wife, they killed you. Or your husband. Um, if you're seen talking sometimes, they killed you. How would they kill you? There's a movie about this, believe it or not, I always have my movie references. This is called The Killing Fields. The whole thing was, of course, told by an eyewitness who mysteriously survived. Here's how they would kill most of these people. Yes, they shot a lot of people, but that wasn't the easiest way that they killed them. They were in these wet rice paddies. If they decided that someone had talked or given them a look that they didn't like, they would take a plastic bag, put it over their head, and push them under the water and drown them. Just like that. In the end, they did this to about 1.2, 1.3 million people, which again pales in comparison to the 60 million who died in China. But remember, China was a country of 700 million people. Cambodia was a country of 7 million people. So the equivalent would have been 120 million dead in China. It was the most successful single act of genocide in the 20th century in terms of the percentage of the population which was killed. And it all took place in about a year, year and a half. And yes, there were Khmer Rouge committees of people who supported them. There were. Mm -hmm. There were groups that were supported, groups that were created at you know, university clubs and so on to endorse the Khmer Rouge. They were communists, they were expelling the West. The saddest thing about what happened in Phnom Penh and in Cambodia, I think, was this. To the extent they had any influence left there, the Americans and the few other embassies did evacuate their own personnel. But they did not evacuate their Cambodian employees because they were not allowed to. The only thing the Khmer Rouge allowed was for the West to evacuate its own people. Where were the Americans? Because this is Indochina after all. Pay attention to the date, 17 April 1975. The Americans had withdrawn their last troops from Saigon several weeks previously. So the Americans had just left Indochina. And not by accident. We're going to look at the vagaries of American policy fairly soon. Um, yes, eventually there was some hand-wringing about this. At the time, though, of course, Everyone celebrated the American departure. Because after all, it was an evil war. It was an unjust war. The Americans should leave. In fact, in Congress, I kid you not, they literally had debates about whether they should allow the Khmer Rouge to triumph in Cambodia. And the congressmen who voted to cut off all funding and aid for the South Vietnamese army, for the Cambodian forces, said, yes, we should allow the Khmer Rouge to take over. Because we have no dog in the fight. Thus, they emptied a modern city of three million people, destroyed all of its records, all of its bank notes, <laughs> amazingly, all of its books, all of the hospitals, 
And then they kill, well, I suppose about a third of the population. The rest of them just barely survived if they survived at all. A truly horrible story. How to explain it? Well, I don't know if there really is an explanation. Human depravity, the march of the intellectuals pursuing cold-blooded ideas to their logical conclusions. In the end, though, I think there was an abdication of authority. An abdication of authority by the Americans who had the presence there, at least until several weeks beforehand. Yes, by the Americans who, because of their own internal political reasons, no longer wanted to fund the war that they had been you know, supporting in Vietnam. It's a very sad story. Now, again, maybe they shouldn't have been there to begin with, just like you could say that in Africa with the Belgians or the French or the British. But this is the moral dilemma. Once you're there, I think you do have a certain responsibility. And this is one of the saddest, I think, legacies of America's involvement in Indochina. Yes, America was not literally involved in Cambodia in the way it was in Vietnam. So you can't ma maybe say that the parallel is quite as strict as it is with the boat people who fled the advance of the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese in 1975. That's a separate subject which we're going to handle in its own time. But you should pay very close attention to the timing. It was not simply that America had left, but that for the second time in the century, America was essentially without a president. You may remember that Woodrow Wilson had a stroke at the time of Versailles, late in 1919, said so that for the next 18 months, America was effectively without a president. This was, of course, at the very height of the discrediting of the White House by the Watergate scandal. Um, actually, America did have a president by this time, but he was the only president in American history not to be elected. That was Gerald Ford. He's also the only president I ever met personally, um, Gerald Ford. Yeah, I got served ginger ale by his wife, Betty Ford, who was famous as a recovering alcoholic. He's a nice man, but ineffectual. Yeah. Yeah, the Betty Ford Clinic. Yeah, they serve ginger ale to everyone. Um, anyway, so Gerald Ford was an unelected president with no authority, no popular mandate, uh, no ability even to influence Congress in any way. So that America, again, was effectively without a president. That is one thing about the collapse of imperial authority, colonialism, what have you, something that many people ardently wished for, just as they ardently wished for the American departure from Indochina. People who maybe should have forgotten, you should always be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. Um, I'm going to stop there for now. I suppose since we are going to do a lecture on Friday, since we're not doing the quiz, I'll, I will roll into the American role and we're going to look at Vietnam and American politics because, of course, that is a big part of the background to this story. Uh, the new plan then is that we will have a quiz a week from Friday. Um, again, a short essay on either early Cold War or decolonization. So it shouldn't be too hard to figure out subjects. Okay?